Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the World Over Live. The flood of immigrants seeking a better life continues on the southern U.S. border. It is both a humanitarian crisis and one of national sovereignty. But what is the solution? At the same time, Israel has launched a ground offensive against Hamas in Gaza. Given my next guest's experience, he's more than qualified to weigh in on these issues and many more. In fact, he offers some thoughtful answers on the future by looking to the past. In his new book, The Greatest Comeback, How Richard Nixon Rose from Defeat to Create the New Majority. He's a syndicated columnist and former advisor to three presidents. Please welcome back to the program, Patrick J. Buchanan. How are you, Raymond? Great to see you again. Good to see you, my friend. Now, let's talk about this. Sure. The GOP in 1965 is faced with a two-time loser in Richard Nixon. Mm -hmm. This guy just lost in a huge way. Mm -hmm. You see similarities between his situation, where the GOP is now. What's the answer? What's the lesson? Well, the Republican Party in 1965 had lost two straight national elections. The last one, a complete disaster, 25 points, 44 states. Nixon himself was a loser. There are a number of things that are part of the answer. The first one is Nixon went out in 1966 and campaigned first in 1964. Mm -hmm. He went out and fought and bled for Barry Goldwater in the full knowledge that the party was going down to disastrous defeat to save as many as he could. And he was rewarded with thanks and gratitude from an awful lot of conservatives. 66, he went out and did the same thing, predicted he's going to pick up 40 states at Lyndon Johnson's expense, got 47 states. So that, I think, the idea of loyalty and fighting for the party, which were natural to him, turned out to be also advantageous because to he, him. Because he even described himself as a progressive conservative, Pat. He was hardly Barry Goldwater or Ronald Reagan material. Right. When I went up and uh, had my meeting with him for three hours and was hired, he looked at me and said, uh, you're conservative. You're not as conservative as Bill Buckley, are you? <laughs> I said, I have great respect for Bill Buckley. Oh, boy. Look at that. The Buchanan <laughs> sure, dodge right from the that beginning. Was a, that was a problem area in the interview I did. <laughs> How did you come to meet him? How did I you first meet him? I met him in St. Louis. I, the first time I met him, I was uh, about 14 years old at the Burning Tree Country Club. Oh, my. Sitting on the caddy log out there late in the afternoon when the plaid golf bag of the vice president of the United States comes out. And the assistant pro looks over at me and my friend Pete Cook, and he's really wary. These amateur caddies are there. <laughs> and he brought us, and I went around uh, 18 holes with uh, Richard Milhouse Nixon wow. at Burning Tree when I was about 14 or 15. About 10 years later, I'm in St. Louis, editorial writer. I got myself invited to a cocktail party. I wanted to meet him. Went up to him in the kitchen and said, if you're going to run in 1968, I'd like to get aboard early. Two weeks later, I was in his office in New York for a three-hour interview. Wow. If you have a question for Pat Buchanan, 1-800-221-9460 in the U.S., internationally, 205-271-2980, or drop us an email, worldover at EWTN.com, or you can tweet me at Raymond Arroyo. We will be getting to some of the hot-button news that's breaking sure. as we speak, and uh, I know you want to weigh in on that, but I, I want to get a little further into the greatest comeback. Right. There is something in the book, there's a moment where you say, um, you have these memos that go back and forth. Right. And what I love about the book is I, I've read a lot about right. Richard Nixon, read a number of biographies, read all of his memoirs. I had never seen these memoys. Where did these memos come from, Pat? They came deep in my basement. Look, oh, <laughs> Rich, you got your I've own National there. Archive in I've there. I've had them in there for years and years, have not seen them for years and years going into them. But what they were was the way I dealt with Nixon is he was in the next office. And rather than go in and ask, I would type out a memo and this, you know, and I'd make a lot of mistakes, as you can see in the memos, yeah. typing and things. Right. And then I'd put him into a pile and give them to him, drop them in his briefcase. He'd take them home and he'd come back and write notes the next day. Excellent analysis. Get in touch with him. No, this guy's a such and such, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Colorful stay away, memos. Stay away from him and everything. Yeah. But it was we had a terrific communication. Problem. And then I spent about, you know, two, three, four hours a day sitting across from him because he was a, tremendously intellectually curious. Mm -hmm. He would come in and he said, okay, now tell me why you conservatives believe this. And we'd argue something back and forth and he would come back. You know, once or twice I came out, came out agreeing with his original position and he was agreeing with mine, you know, yeah. because, but he was, he was tremendously, it's a politics, personality, issues, foreign policy, especially intellectually alive, aware, 
And I think, you know, dreaming that after all these defeats, there was still a, a path down that sideline to the mm. goal line. What, what you realize when you read this is the great influence that you had on him. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was, his disposition right. was normally to the moderate and sort of to the left. He, I mean, this is the guy who founded the EPA and the National Endowment we, for the Arts. He was a member Ocean. of the Council on Foreign Relations. I said, we got to get rid of that one, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so you were, you were trying to make him well, ready see, for prime time the in the first, Republican Party. I was the first Goldwater conservative, you know, the post-war conservative movement that arose with National Review, mm -hmm. Goldwater movement, and the rest of it. The first one, I think, in his entourage. All of the folks previously with Nixon and his staff in 60 really were down on the right wing because they had gutted Nixon in California, mm -hmm. the governor's race, disliked the Goldwater people and everything. Mm -hmm. But I was there, and I was, you know, far, far more conservative than Nixon was, but he was very interested in what you had to say. And I said, look, the thing we got to do, Raymond, is I said, if we can marry the Goldwater right to the Nixon center of the party, there's nobody on the left that can beat us for the nomination. Mm -hmm. we, cra we can crowd them out. And then we can move and get those Northern Catholics who are socially conservative, like my family, mm -hmm. the guys I went to school with, and the Southern Protestants who are breaking now because they don't like the liberalism of the Democratic Party, but are currently with Wallace. And we can build a, uh, a great coalition to defeat FDR. Is there a lesson here for the political parties as they exist today, for both the Democratic and the Republican parties? The, the Republican Party, let's face it right now, mm -hmm. though they have majorities here in right. the House and they're creeping up in the Senate, right? nationally, it seems to be very disunified. It's hard to see the president. I mean, I could see back then a presidential coalition that could defeat the Democratic coalition of FDR for years and Kevin Phillips was writing his book mm -hmm. then about that very idea, 68, and he came aboard. And I, what did I say? I wrote Nixon a memo. There, I said, there is an awesome creature out here in my office. <laughs> I mean, he was so brilliant. He was so brilliant that he, he got it and others got it. But today, you know, I can't see it, Raymond. I mean, there's 18 states that have gone Democratic six straight times, mm -hmm. and they're getting more demographic, more Democratic, and the demography is moving against us because Hispanic population is growing, Asian population is growing, African and, uh, population is growing. They go between 70 and 90 percent Democratic in every presidential election, and they are growing, mm -hmm. and the European-American population is sh gradually shrinking in size. It's moving towards 60 percent of the population and 70 percent of the electorate. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, tell me, as you look out, if you look at the candidates that are out there, Rand Paul and, and uh, Ted Cruz and right. Marco Rubio and R Paul Ryan mm -hmm. and Rick Santorum. And Can you stand the excitement? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I you said that, Ted. <laughs> shouldn't have said that. Uh, Chris no, Christie. look, there's a lot of them. I know Rand Paul, and he's got a lot of qualities. I admire his courage in standing up on the war issue. Can any of them beat Hillary Clinton? At this point, I don't think so. Mm. I think what we need, and here's one thing that Nixon had going for him. It was luck in a sense, but at the, he was coming back at the very point the Democratic Party, the Great Coalition, twice as large as the Republican Party, was falling apart. George Wallace was ripping off not only the South, but all these populist Catholic conservatives mm -hmm. in the North. They loved that message he was giving them, you know. There's not a dime's worth of difference between the two parties. Then you had the left, Bobby Kennedy, Eugene McCarthy, George McGovern, moving anti-war, savaging Johnson, you know, appealing to the kids who were yelling, hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? Yeah. And eventually, you know, the, uh, the Ho 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 Chi Minh the NLF is going to win. And so mm. all those were inside the Democratic Party and they were all pulling apart. And that's what gave us the opportunity to seize fractions, big fractions of that party mm. on the center right. He tells you something very early on. In 1966, he right. said, uh, before you can even think about 68, running mm. in 68, we have to restore the party base. Exactly. Do you see that message needing to resonate now? I think he, needing it, I, I, I think that's exactly right. But look where the base was in 1965 when I talked to him in that kitchen. That's uh -huh. exactly what he said. Republicans had 140 House seats, the Democrats 295. We had 32 senators, they had 68. I think we had 17 governors, about one-third of the governors. Mm -hmm. And so that base was shrunken, but the base they've got, Republicans have got today is much larger, 90 more seats in the House. But you look at the future, and it, you don't see that bright light over the horizon. Mm -hmm. It looks like it may be twilight for the GOP. Mm. 
This is the man who wrote Where the Right Went Wrong, mm -hmm. the, the Suicide of a Superpower. So much Death of, of the you, West, all that very positive so, work. Yeah, all those positive, <laughs> uplifting books. But everything you write about in those right. books has largely come to pass. And I mean, we'll get into some of that right. in a moment. Uh, I, before I leave Nixon, we have to ask, where did this idea come of the forgotten American, the great mm -hmm. silent majority, as he would later That came out, them? I mean, the, the, the 60s, were, what, what happened, the 60s, you had soaring crimes, you had urban riots, you had anarchy by the overprivileged on the campuses, and all, and, and denunciations, and demonstrations everywhere. And Nixon kept saying, look, there's people out there, hardworking people, taxpaying folks who love this country, and he, we, he, we use forgotten Americans and quiet Americans and other phrases. And in one memo, I had, I mentioned twice the phrase silent majority, and it's double underlined by Richard Nixon. Uh -huh. And it would pop up in 1969 in that great speech, basically, that made his presidency, mm. the great silent majority to stand up behind me. Nixon soared to 68 percent approval, you know, and this was not a character. Did you write that speech? Nixon wrote that speech entirely by himself. Nobody helped him on it. But I will say I sent him memos and saying uh, we're at a fateful point in the presidency. Either uh, uh, we're going to run the country or this crowd out in the street's going to run it. And mm. I think you've got to go on national television, deliver a speech. The next day, uh, Nixon said there'll be a speech on November 3rd. My goodness. Now, look, like Goldwater, mm. you doubled down. Mm -hmm. When you ran for president twice, you right. didn't you didn't tack to the left a bit and try to. It seems you didn't play the that coalitions quite well, the that way. That isn't the way you Nixon overthrow did. a president of the United States. <laughs> 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 Look, George H. W. Bush was at ninety percent six six months before I challenge him. Right. What am I going to go in and say? Actually, I agree with President Bush on a number of issues, <laughs> but I'm a more attractive fellow. <laughs> you certainly give a better speech. You, well, you had to come on. That whole idea in 1992 was to go and run a campaign, exciting campaign, and get all these young people out, and and then and hope, frankly, that Johnson, he would, Bush would say what Lyndon Johnson did. I, you know, I've served one term, and I don't think I'm going to run. I've had enough. And then you'd be running to daylight. Mm -hmm. I want to talk didn't about work. something else. Didn't work. Uh, well, you yeah. tried twice, though, right. and it was you gave it your all. Right. Uh, Nixon and Reagan, you reveal in the book had an alliance. The, I've never seen this anywhere. Where did this come from? Well, it and, came, out of, came out of things in my files and letters and things. And a friend of mine brought some letters uh, that he had gotten out of the Nixon archives. And they seemed to be simply letters between Reagan and Nixon, you know. But if you put them all together with the files I had, it, it looked to me like a deal had been cut at Bohemian Grove in 1967. Huh. Where Nixon spoke and Reagan was, you know, that's where all the mm. Republican bulls mm -hmm. get together. Yeah. And, and the deal was that Nixon would get the first crack at the liberals in the Republican Party, the Rockefeller-Romney wing. Mm. And if he hadn't demolished them by Wisconsin, which was the second primary, Reagan would be free to come in and try to grab the nomination. Mm. Because the letters were saying, as, as you, Reagan, Dick, as you know, some of my guys got a little bit out of hand and trying to push push me forward and I didn't I had to put him down and things <laughs> I understand Ron you know and uh -huh. all that so and there was a column by uh, de Toledano which said the deal had been cut and I sent it into Nixon and it came back with Nixon's usual check mark uh -huh. but I had marked that passage where it said just such a deal had been cut and the very fact that he didn't comment on it told me that he had been the guy behind to Toledano's column. He had been the source. Uh -huh. Because to Toledano had been with him ever since the his case. Interesting. Interesting. What, what's the, co compare those two. You worked for both of these men very closely. Right. R Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan. I, I hope you're going to write the book about the Reagan years as well. Right. Is that coming? Well, I know I had, you promise here part two. I had about nine, nine years with Nixon and two with Reagan in the White House. Mm -hmm. uh, but this, of course, only covers three years. But I would hope to write the, the sequel to this and in that deal with the Reagan years as well, the connections between Reagan and Nixon, my, di my days and hours at Reykjavik and all those, some of those other yeah. occasions. Yeah. Those are great stories. They're wonderful stories. We will be back in a moment. We're going to get into the immigration crisis, what's happening in Israel, and much more. Pat Buchanan returns mm -hmm. after this short break, mm -hmm. and he'll take your calls and emails when the world over live returns. Stay right mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Well, thank oh. you. Was, uh...
now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the World Over Live, syndicated columnist and author of the new book, The Greatest Comeback. Pat Buchanan joins me once again, and we're ready to take your calls and emails. If you have a question for Pat, 1-800-221-9460 is the number in the U.S. Internationally, 205-271-2980, or drop us an email, worldover at EWTN.com, and I'll read your tweets as well at Raymond Arroyo. Pat, this immigration crisis mm -hmm. breaking out at the border, you've written about this for years and years. What do you make of this situation? What's the solution? Mm -hmm. Well, what I make of it, if we don't get control of our southern border, it's becoming increasingly Hispanicized in all those states, t Texas and California, New Mexico. And if you get a majority of Hispanics in those states, in, uh, in, in about 10 years, I mean, folks reaching out to those, uh, those Hispanic folks, if they demand that you uh, open the border between Mexico and the United States, some people are going to concede to that. And I think that's the end of the United States, mm -hmm. basically as an independent, separate, unique, identifiable nation. I think you see a quasi-merger of the two countries in this area along both sides of the border. <clears throat> and I, again, I think that's the end of the country as we knew it. Mm. Now, some people hear that and they say, mm -hmm. Pat Buchanan, these are people who are seeking a better life. These are people who, are. who, who uh, believe in the same faith you do. They bring their values north of the border, and that could be good for the United States of America. Well, look, there's no doubt these are, I mean, first, the children, these little kids and tots are not guilty of anything. Second, the desire to come to the United States, I understand it in every country on earth, and especially those countries where people are under repression, they're living in poverty, they want to have a better life for their children. But you got to have, we're also a country as well. And you've got to defend your own national family. And who decides who comes in and who does not? And the United States is currently overwhelmed, both its social, its, I mean, its social programs and all the rest of it. I mean, we cannot take in the whole world mm. in its statement. And the president of the United States has got to make the kind of tough decisions Dwight Eisenhower did. There are a hundred illegal, a million illegal aliens in Texas when he took office and he, he told a general, go down, and you're going to tell them they can't come into this country and they're going to have to go back. They put them on buses and ships. And this is what I would do. Let me tell you exactly what I would do if I were Obama. I would t take the issue from the Republicans who have been worthless on it, quite frankly, over the years. They talk and talk and talk. I would say, you want your security fence? Give me a billion dollars. I will build your security fence. Secondly, I'm going to call the president of Mexico and tell him to keep those buses five miles away from the border or we will come in and take those five miles ourself and do the job because you are complicit in the invasion of our country. I would do that and then I would obviously if you take you're not going to send somebody back to his death or something. The other side of Obama is of course his compassionate side and his liberal side if you will and I would and he probably could maintain that if he had a tough side as well. Mm. I want to read you an email. This comes uh, from who is this from? Hold on one second. This is from Donald in New Jersey, and he writes, In the public debates over President Obama's presidency, the argument is raised that the president has out-Nixoned Nixon, mm -hmm. uh, or words to that effect. Could a valid comparison between Nixon's corruptions and the present administration's corruptions be raised? <laughs> Uh, no, Nixon, I mean, Barack Obama, where I think he's guilty, and I've come out against this idea of impeachment, because I don't think there's any actions that would justify that. Where he's guilty to me is it's sort of, it's the dereliction of duty, it's the indifference to doing what is his response. I mean, the security of the states, the borders of the states of the Union is a presidential responsibility. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't say, look, I don't think I'm going to do that. Right. And so, but... <clears throat> But in terms of, are there something, is there, has Barack Obama participated in some kind of cover-up of, of illegal activity? Let me say this. If the IRS had been authorized or directed by the White House to go after those folks, little Tea Party folks, that would be infinitely worse than Nixon saying harass some big shot by ordering an audit on, of his tax return, mm -hmm. which presumably would come out okay. Yeah. Uh, I want to shift gears for a moment. I want to talk about something we're dealing with right mm -hmm. now in the Middle right. East. This is an area you visited. You talk in the book about uh, the we early were, days going to Israel. We were with Israel. I was with Nixon in Israel in the weeks right after the Six-Day War. I was also with him in 73 down in Florida 
when the Yom Kippur War started and Nixon sent everything and tanks and everything else to save the Israeli army in the Sinai. And Golda Meir said that he was the best friend that Israel had ever had. And then you got Nixon on the tapes making comments about Jewish folks. Mm -hmm. And so what you got to do with Nixon is put them together. He saves Israel. He's got all these tremendous appointments for uh, Jewish Americans. And there's bad language used in the Oval Office. Mm -hmm. And that's what I try to do in the book. You know? yeah. it's, look, here's what he said. Here's what he did. You judge. Yeah, you figure it out. <laughs> now, now we're seeing this um, military action in Gaza, right. uh, the Israelis marching into the Gaza region to close down the tunnels where a lot of the, right. the you know, these, these uh, missiles are coming from. Yes, yeah. And they're taking on Hamas. The right thing to do? The Israelis? Yep. Well, I think the Israelis got to make the decision themselves for what they're going to do. And there's no question they're using this opportunity to decapitate Hamas to the degree they can and to degrade these rockets, which apparently were made in metal shop at Gaza High or something, you right. know, they're yeah. ridiculous little things. They yeah. are, and of course, they got they were terrible dropping on your city. But I think you know what Nixon would do now? He would back Israel, but he would be working behind the scenes with the Egyptians. And frankly, he would want to put out lines to the Gazans to stop the killing and stop this thing, mm -hmm. and see what he can do. He would love to. I mean, uh, he would love to have put something together that stopped this and maybe ended it, at least got a temporary truce of some kind. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> let's go to a call. This is Pat from Texas. Pat, you've got Pat here. What's your question? Hello. Thank you for taking my call. Um, Good. My question is, hello, can you hear me? Yo, we yes, can hear you, Pat. You. Go on. We, we got, we're, we're pressed for time, so give me your question. I'm so sorry. Um, what plan components would you like to see put into action to alleviate the current crisis in, at the border? Not something that should have been done, should have had a wall built, but what about right. now, the children who are here now? What okay. would you do about the kids who are here now, Pat? Well, I think uh, the, well, look, you don't send the tots who are, don't have their parents, anyone with them and drop them back into Central America. But I would, if you look at their tough teenagers, you're gonna tell them they gotta go back home and they're going back home. Mm -hmm. And that's what I, the object, the, the policy should be that they go back home unless there's some extraordinary circumstance, you don't send anybody to his death. But as, as I say, you got, look, the Mexicans are colluding in this. They're bringing these people right up to the border where they walk into the United States and suddenly they're entitled to a lawyer and a hearing and all the rest of it. And so I think you've got to keep them away from the border. And if they know they can't even get to the border itself mm -hmm. and then they have a security fence, they're not going to come. But uh. why did it take us? Does it take the United States, the superpower, 20 years to figure out how to secure its own border? I mean, the Israelis had a problem in the Negev Desert. Yeah. They had some terrorist types walk, trying to walk in. And African folks fleeing the horrible situation in Northeast Africa. And he said, we can't take them into our country. So they built a security fence and it's working. Hmm. Let's talk about this Malaysian <clears throat> aircraft. Apparently downed the U.S. intelligence we have right. at the moment is there was a missile launch. That's what brought this, this, uh, this right. plane down. In Ukraine, 300 lives lost. What do you make of this? Did, what side of the border do you think this came from? Is this Ukraine or Russia that launched that missile? What's I your best guess? My best guess is the Ukrainian army did not do it or government did not do it. I don't believe the Russians did it or would do it because it was a horrible thing. Terrible. It would, would benefit them, not at all. My guess is, and it's only a guess, is that the Ukrainian rebels got control of a surface-to-air missile system, not one of these shoulder-fired things, but one of the SA systems, and they thought it was another one of these supply planes carrying Ukrainian troops or Ukrainian equipment uh, to battle them, and they shot it down as they've shot others down. I don't think any one of these parties uh, would put deliberately massacre 293, 200 some people on a Malaysian airliner if they knew it was a Malaysian airliner. Okay, I want to go to another call. Sandra from Arizona. What's your question, Sandra? Hi, my question is, why can't they put up an electric fence just like they do to keep cattle inside or dogs, you know, from going out of their yard? Mm -hmm. 
Why can't they put up an electric fence? Well, you've got to have a collar for an electric fence, and these are human right. beings, but to right. start. But. Well, you, what you need, I think, is what you need is a double line fence, and then take the uh, uh, trucks in there and make it like a carpet so that you can see the, the footprints in there. And then you've got a tower or something like that manned about every, you know, 10 miles, and you've got cameras in there, and you've got your drones. But if you did a conscientious job, and those guys are not bad people in the Border Patrol, I think you could handle it. You may have to change some laws and tell some folks, look, if you get in the in country, I mean, you don't automatically get a hearing or something like that, mm -hmm. that we have the capacity or right to just push you right back out again. This 2008 law, mm -hmm. some are saying it should be changed. The president says it should be changed. Now many Democrats are backing off of that. In fact, today, right. uh, they came out and said, we can't support this. The law should remain as it is, and these children from Central America mm -hmm. should be allowed to stay. They should not be turned back. Well, let me, I mean, uh, let me ask you a question. You know, if somebody's being brutalized in Zimbabwe under Comrade Bob Mugabe, do they have a right to come to the United States? Or once they get out of Zimbabwe into South Africa itself, are they any longer a refugee or something mm -hmm. like that? In other words, these folks came into Mexico. Right. You know, say the Mexican, why are you putting on them a train and sending them a thousand miles north? Mm -hmm. And that's, if you got the coyotes that, that are doing this and you can apprehend them, Frankly, you know, if, if the Mexicans are not respecting our border, I would not respect theirs. Hmm. Ted from Maryland. What's your question, Ted? Mr. Buchanan and Raymond, thank you for taking my call. Uh, sure. What Roman Catholic Republican candidate has the best chance of success in the next election? Hmm. Is there one? Is there a is Roman San, Catholic Santorum candidate? I think. Uh, is he going to run? He could. I don't know if he's going to run. Is there anyone else? As a Chris Christie? Catholic? Chris Christie's Catholic. Um, I don't know who else. Well, Chris, let's take Chris Christie because uh, Raymond and I were talking earlier, mm -hmm. and he held out a tremendous promise. That he's a tough guy, and he did extremely well oh. in, in a blue state, and he's got a lot of qualities of decisiveness that people like, but we just don't know how badly he's been damaged by this bridge gate. And secondly, the problems in New Jersey and financial problems are second only to Illinois, you know. Mm. And that place is just about underwater, Rand. Well, one of the most <laughs> troubling things was, you know, he, he uh, Chris Christie is a right. br blunt talker. He calls the press out. He's in your face. When they asked him to comment to the Hobby Lobby ruling, he said, I have no comment. Mm -hmm. What? <laughs> you know, that, that well, was that's, peculiar. That's, that, well, that's the calcul calculating response, mm -hmm. which goes against the grain of what you want and what you thought he, you had. What about Bobby Jindal, one of our tweeters? Well, you know, Bobby Jindal's done a good, he's done a good job, done a lot of good things, but... Uh, I don't know if he's going to run, and uh, he just, he doesn't seem to be a, a strong, prepossessing candidate. He hasn't been out there. You need, I think you need someone with some real dynamism and strength, you know, and I haven't seen it. I mean, he's an outstanding governor, undeniably. Yeah. No, he's done, he's done some incredible things there, but that's right. the question. We'll, we'll, who can hold up to the scrutiny of the, the moment? But there, there, there is, politically speaking, mm -hmm. there is a landscape that one sees where there's a path for somebody to emerge well, and to at least challenge. I've never seen a situation where no candidate has more than 14 or 15 percent in the polls this early. 96, Bob Dole started out over 50 percent. Hillary's probably at 70 or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I think the opportunity is really there for a Republican if they got it in them and they have some fresh ideas and they've got some real strength of leadership to drive through and win this, uh, win this nomination. Mm -hmm. Final question. Uh, when you look at uh, everything that's happened since your time with Richard Nixon, mm -hmm. what do you regret most about that period? And what do you remember most fondly? Well, what I regret most is, the, um, is certainly the Watergate, which brought down President Nixon and destroyed uh, a tremendously successful presidency. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, it was what happened to uh, the folks in uh, Saigon and the folks in Cambodia, mm. when Nixon's presidency was broken and the North Vietnamese overran the South, what mm. you get a million, million dead in Cambodia, mm. hundreds of thousands, maybe a million in the South China Sea, boat people, mm. and the loss of the war, America. I mean, the United States Army didn't lose that war, but America lost that war two years, right. about eight, I guess about eight months after he left or 10 months after he mm. left office. It was, that's yeah. the worst. But one of the best, the best are the, uh, are the times with uh, at, at Reykjavik with Ronald Reagan, which was, you thought you're almost <laughs> in a movie, <laughs> getting up from the table and walking out and, 
it was it was terrific, and there were great times with uh, with Richard Milhouse Nixon, and one of them, of course, was that '66 campaign, <laughs> where we bested Lyndon Baines Johnson. Let me tell you a quick anecdote. Okay. After the election in '68, we all went to the White House. The staff of Johnson met with the new staff of Nixon, and we were all introduced to the president. We all walked down the line, and I'd been working on Johnson's case for two years, two and three years with Nixon. So we go up and we shake hands with him. And, and Lynn, I said, how are you, Mr. President? I'm Pat Buchanan. And he looked down at me and said, I know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. Well, the only time that was like a badge of honor, right? <laughs> Let me out of here. <laughs> Pat Buchanan, thank you for being here. Take it easy. Hope to see you again soon. Right. Pat's latest book, The Greatest Comeback, How Richard Nixon Rose from Defeat to Create the New Majority, is available at bookstores everywhere and online.